provided that a chunk of those didn't die from natural causes, which is a risk as well. So here's some realistic numbers for you. Go ahead, Barb. Okay, these are just kind of cool. This doesn't necessarily factor into our discussion too much, but it's kind of cool. This crazy plot with all the bubbles is crappies from the triple foliage last year. And you can see sizes along the bottom and the age of those fish going here along the vertical axis. And we can do a couple things with this. So give me one tap bar. One thing we can do is we can look at the size range for fish of a certain year. So our four-year-old fish, a four-year-old fish for crappies could be anywhere from seven to nine inches. That's probably more variation than most of you assumed existed out there, but there's a lot of variation in fish growth. They're no different than people or house plants or bacteria or dogs or whatever. They're all living organisms. They grow at different rates. The other thing we can do with this, give me one more tap, Barb. If you're catching a bunch of 10-inch crappies this weekend, they could be anywhere from five to nine years old. There's a lot of variation there. The most common size for, or most common age for a 10-inch crappie would be six. That's kind of the middle here, the average. The other thing that we can do is we can track the strength of different year classes coming through the flowage. One more tap, Barb. Oh, did you already do it? Great. So what I did on the, on the far right there is I put the year that each of these fish was born. So we can see our nine-year-old fish would have born in two, been born in 2008. There's not many of them left. That's that 62% mortality. I've had a lot of years where bad things have happened to them, including going home in some of your live wells. If you look at eight-year-olds, they're still not very common. 2010 is still a fairly strong class, and that's most of what you're going to be catching between 10 and 12 inches. 2011 is a really strong class, and 2013 is pretty solid, too. 2012 isn't looking so hot. Does anybody remember what 2012 was like in the spring? It was the earliest ice out on record. And after that happened, we had some really nasty cold fronts. A lot of crappies either didn't spawn, or if they spawned and their eggs hatched, the fry were probably killed by the cold weather. That's another issue with this variation in climate that we're having, is the fish don't know what to expect anymore. They don't have the consistent good uh, conditions for producing recruitment, and it even impacts panfish. Go to bluegill for me here, Barb. Here's the same thing with bluegill, and you can see the growth is a little more consistent here. They kind of pass from one size to the next without as much variation. Our crappies tend to be a little bit more um, variable overall. So give me one more tap. So if you're catching eight inch bluegill and harvesting them, they're probably five to seven years old. And once again, one more tap, Barb. This 2012 class is pretty weak. It impacted bluegills too. So 2012, not a great year for really anything to reproduce out there. This year will probably be a little better because once the ice is out here, we should have pretty consistent warm weather. That'll help the fish out quite a bit. So thought you guys would find that interesting. One more tap, Barb. We can convert that into growth rates for these fish. So this is their trajectory, how fast they get to different sizes. Crappies are in red, triple flowage is solid, statewide average is the dash line, they track each other pretty closely. Bluegill is green, triple flowage solid, statewide average dashed. Bluegill and the triple flowage are growing pretty darn well right now. We got that abundance down, there's a lot of food for them. You have a good predator population, it's kind of like keeping carrots thinned out in your garden. If you keep them thinned out, they grow really well. That's what's happening with our bluegill right now. So we can get them to eight inches in about five years, which is fantastic. So I think bluegill fishing is gonna be very good here um, for the next few years in particular. Okay, Barb. Well, having seen all that, I wanna pull the room again and see if we change. I took a mental picture of where everybody's hands were, every single one of you. <laughs> so who thinks the panfish bag one should stay where it is? Yeah, about the same. Who thinks it should be higher? Still nobody. And who thinks it should be lower? Nobody changed their mind, and that's fine. But now you've seen the data that goes into that kind of decision. So that is going to continue to play out through the Conservation Congress. There will be a question next year that will probably be determining the fate of the bag limit out here. And anybody can get involved in the Conservation Congress. There's a meeting in every single county throughout the state. Um, they're looking at doing online voting sometime soon. I don't know if it'll be ready by next year, but that would help out of state folks too. If that what goes forward and passes, it would probably not be implemented until 2020. So we're going to have a couple more years of the 25 bag limit. And that's, that's almost a certainty at this point. So um, can keep that all in mind. There's no reason you can't start regulating yourself if you feel panfish limits are a little bit too high. Is that Ty Senate? It is. How you doing, Ty? Good. How you doing, man? Good. Hey, what's your opinion? Oh, see, I'm very neutral. I, I never think lower panfish bag limits, it's never a bad idea. Yeah. Is it 100% necessary here? 
it's hard for me to say that either. There's no smoking gun that says, here's the big problem we're trying to solve. We've kind of got things to a pretty good place right now. But again, lowering the limits, it's never a bad idea. So it's going to be mostly up to the anglers and whether they want to regulate themselves. That's kind of where I'm at with it. All right, let's do muskies. I have so much cool musky stuff for you. So much cool musky stuff. And the theme here is stock smarter, not harder. Kind of like work smarter, not harder. Everybody likes seeing the big, gaudy stocking, stocking numbers. Well, that's a challenge for a variety of reasons. It's, it really is a strain on our resources. Um, it makes it harder for us to hit those targets at the hatchery. So if we can stock smarter and use a smaller number of fish to get as good or maybe even a better result, that should be a major goal of ours. And that's what we've been working on over the last few years. A major thing that's helped us with that is pit tags. And maybe you've heard me talk about this in the past. We're going to talk about it a lot tonight. And now you guys can get involved in that because Deerfoot is going to have their own pit tag reader. Yeah, there's Amanda. So Amanda and Jim have been trained in on this. And if you're up here staying with them or coming to get a burger, I don't know what her policy is going to be, but you can ask Amanda if you can check this out from her and you can take it out to help us collect data on muskies in the chip of flowage. All right, so this will be here all year. And Amanda can show you how to use it. I'm going to show you what we're going to do with the data. All right? Go ahead, Barb. So this is what a pit tag looks like. It looks like a little grain of rice with some copper in it. It's the same tags they're putting in your pets. So if your dog gets lost and they find it, they scan it. Exact same thing. We're just doing it with muskies. Why not, right? So we have put over 23,000 of these tags into muskies in Sawyer County, including a giant chunk of them going right here in the Chippewa flowage. And the way we're able to get that number up so fast is when we stock muskies, we're putting the tag in them right before they leave the hatchery. And that is hugely valuable for a number of reasons. And I'll show you later on what we do with that. There's quite a few other lakes in the area that have a lot of tags too. These are all tags going into stockfish. These are tags that we put into adults that we captured in the field. Go ahead, Barb. The first thing that we started doing with these pit tags as far as changing how we manage our lakes is looking at stocking size. We've known forever that if you stock really big musky fingerlings, they're going to have better survival. It's very intuitive, right? There's not many things that can eat them, but they can eat everything else. Once they get to that big size, they're pretty safe. The challenge is it's really expensive to raise those. So there's a cost benefit that goes on. So what we wanted to do with these pit tags is try and zero in on exactly how big we need to get those fingerlings in the hatchery to get the survival benefits without breaking the bank. If we didn't need to push them all the way to 16, 17, 18 inches, if we could get away with 12, 13, 14 inches, we want to do that. So that's what we're trying to do. Go for me here, Barb. All right, graphs. Everybody likes graphs. This is a graph of muskies that we stocked in the Chippewa Flowage in 2013. You can see their size along the bottom. That's their size when they hit the lake. And the percentages shown over here. So it creates a distribution. So the blue area is everything we stocked and what their size was. So you can see we stocked a few nine and a half inch fish, but they were really rare. We stocked a lot of 11 and a half, 12, 12 and a half inch fish. What we did then is when we came back to the lake and started catching these fish, one, two, three, four years later on, we can go look back at what that individual fish's size was at the time we stocked it. And we can plot it on here. And what, what, how we interpret this is if a bar, a red bar is lower than the blue shaded area, we are seeing lower than expected survival at that size. So we stocked about 28% of our fish at 11 and a half inches, but only less than 10% of what we're seeing survive was 11 and a half inches. When the red bars get really high, that means we're seeing better than expected survival. That's where our survival advantage is. So on the chip of flowage, when we get them up to 12 inches, they start doing really well. We don't have to get them to 19, 20 inches. We only have to get them to 12. Typically what we're stocking though, not all of them are there. So what we did is we created a goal for our hatchery Next time we stock the triple foliage, let's get them all over 12. Let's give them all a good chance to survive. Let's get them over what appears to be a fairly critical threshold. Go ahead, Barb. So we worked with Muskies Inc. locally and our hatchery at Governor Thompson, who do fantastic work. And we created this year class of giant muskies that we stocked out in the chip of foliage. Giant, like you'd say jumbo shrimp, right? They're not really giants. They're only 14, 13 inches. But compared to our goal, we did very well. We got 85% of them over 12 inches and then we stocked them out. Now when we come back and check up on these fish, what we would expect to see if we were successful is our red bars tracking our whole distribution here, meaning every fish we stocked 
has a pretty good chance of surviving because they were all beyond our, our critical threshold. So, Barb, let's take a look at that. Not too bad. Now we are seeing much better survival from our entire distribution, including some of the smaller ones we stocked. Because now our small fish are still bigger than our former big fish. Does that make sense? Everybody with me there? So this is a really good thing. And we have other really good signs from this 2016 year class. Go ahead, Barb. One good sign is that they hit the lake running. They hit the water in October. We go back and we look for them the next year in May. <coughs> In that period of time, they average 1.3 inches of growth, which doesn't sound like a lot. It's this, but they're only 13 inches long to begin with. They added 10% of their body weight during a non-peak growing season. And that explains a lot about why bigger fingerlings do better. Not only is it harder for a pike or something else to eat them because they're a little bit bigger, they have more food options available to them. They've got a bigger mouth. A nine inch fingerling might have to just wait for the perfect size minnow to fit around that it could actually stuff down its little throat. A 14 inch fingerling? Oh, you're eating bluegill, you're eating little bass, you're eating all sorts of minnows and perch. You have a lot of good food options available to you. You also have more fat reserves. So if it takes you a little while to acclimate to the lake, if you're having some kind of, you know, acclimation issues, uh, you've got time because you have some fat to, to fall back on. Go ahead, Barb. This is gonna blow some minds. We're gonna look at maps, right? The other thing we started doing is tracking the stocking location of each fish. So every pit tagged fish goes in at one of these three locations in 2016. Treeland, CC North, and CC South. So every time we go back and catch a fish, we know exactly where we stocked it in. And that is a hugely valuable piece of information for a variety of reasons. It tells us if some stocking locations are better than others. It tells us if we need to be using more stocking locations than three. It tells us a lot about how these fish distribute, and later on it'll tell us, are they gonna come back to that ramp and spawn? Do they think that's where they're from? I get asked that all the time, and I'm never able to answer the question because we've never done anything like this until 2016. So give me a tap, Barb. These black squiggly areas are everywhere we shocked, and every one of these red dots is a muskie that came from the stocking location with the same color. I apologize if you're red-green colorblind. So these are all our CC North fish. You can see them spreading out down the shoreline. They're all over in Durazio Bay, and some of them went over four miles in their first six months in the lake. So they're really spreading out. Obviously, we didn't shock everywhere. So there were probably more fish out here. We just didn't have the ability to capture them. Over time, we're going to be able to continue adding to this map as we catch more fish. Fish stocked out of CC South. They're down there. They're ringing Scott Lake. And we're going to be able to see how these red and yellow dots start to mix together. We're going to go to the east side now. We haven't done as much work over here. That'll be our goal this year is to try and capture some of these east side fish. Fish stocked out of Treelands. Give me a tap, Barb. Two of them were caught by an angler right outside of Treelands who had a pit tag reader, and we caught one in the fall. We'll hopefully be filling out a lot more green dots this year as we spend more time on the water. A big question for us is, do these fish from CC South go to both sides of the foliage, or do they stay on the west side? We picked this location because it's right in the middle of everything, and we're hoping that they're radiating out from there. This will give us a very good idea of whether that's happening or not. And if not, maybe we need to go with more east side locations. Cool stuff, right? So you'll see this map again in the future with more dots. And maybe greens and yellows and reds mixing together. And maybe fish ending up in unexpected places. All right. The last thing we're going to look at here with muskies, go ahead, Barb, is what we call their true growth rate. So if you've heard about growth rate of muskies in the past in Wisconsin or Minnesota or Canada or whatever, you probably got an estimated growth rate. So it's an estimate because we don't actually know how old those fish are in most cases. We go out to the lake, we catch a bunch of muskies, we pull a piece off them, a fin ray, a jawbone if the fish is dead, a scale, and then we look and see how old it is, and then we know how long it is, and we can create that growth curve. The problem is we're good at aging them, but we're not perfect. Where we can be perfect is when we have known age pit tagged fish. So these are the fish that we pit tagged before they left the hatchery. We know their birthday because we watched them hatch out of a jar. We know what they did all summer because we watched them swim around the pond. And we know when they got on the truck and went to the lake. So every time we catch that fish for the rest of its life, we know its birthday. And we know exactly how old it is. It's really labor intensive to do that. I think some of the people in this room have come and helped with Yeah, I see if some people in the room have come and helped with that. We spend a whole day at the hatchery. It's assembly line work, but it's very valuable. And that you know, goes into the, some of the previous charts you've seen. So I'm going to show you 74 
known age fish, not estimated, known age fish from Sawyer County, and this is going to include three lakes, uh, including the Chippewa Foliage. Go for me here, Barb. Dots. We've got dots here. Blue dots are the Chippewa Foliage. Red dots are Sand Lake. Green dots are Lost Land Lake. Age along the bottom, length in inches here. So we'll walk through this. Our one-year-old muskies. This is the first spring after they're stocked. Not too different from their stocking size. Maybe they've gained that 1.3 inches, but they're typically in the mid-teens, especially our Chippewa Foliage fish because we stock them a little bigger. As two-year-olds, they're in the upper teens. At two and three years old, though, they kind of go into their moody teenager phase, and they don't act in a way that makes it easier for us to catch them. They kind of disappear for a while, and then they come roaring back as four-year-olds, especially the boys, because they're starting to get the urge, and they're acting stupid, which makes them wind up in one of our nets. <laughs> so here you can see that we start having a spread between the lakes. Our Chippewa Floage fish tend to be a little bigger than our Sand Lake fish, tend to be a little bigger than our Lost Land fish. Our Chippewa Floage fish at age four years old are between 30 and 35 inches. At five years old, we start to lose our Chippewa Floage fish. Does that mean something bad's happened to them? No, it just means we haven't had that many years since they were stocked. <laughs> we have one that was captured in the fall that we consider to be five years old because it's had five growing seasons. But we will be able to add a lot more five-year-olds, hopefully, this spring, and then next year we'll get six-year-olds. So you can only uh, add them on the graph once they've had enough time to be out there in the lake. What we can do with this is then we can create a growth trajectory for each of these different lakes. And that's what you're going to see, wait, other direction, here. Okay, so these dashed lines are the growth trajectories for the three lakes we were just looking at. And for reference, I put this purple line up here, which is what we've always reported to be our statewide growth rate for muskies. Each of these three lakes in our area is beating that statewide average by some degree. The lost land fish are the slowest growing ones, and that's exactly what we would expect. Lost land is not a very big lake. It has a very high density of muskies. That leads to slow growth. It's as simple as that. There's nothing complicated going on there. Sand Lake and the Chippewa Flowage are tracking with each other a little bit, but with the Chippewa Flowage, we don't have as many of those older age fish to kind of help anchor the top end of the distribution. We will have them soon. The other thing to mention here is I said all these are beating the statewide growth rate. The statewide growth rate is a combination of males and females. This is almost exclusively males. When we start getting more females in here, we're expecting these lines will get pulled up a little bit. And in time, we'll be able to create a, a growth curve for both males and females. That's going to give us a lot of great information about how quickly they're getting to the sizes that you guys care about. Them. 40 inches, 50 inches, maybe more. And once we figure out how many years it takes them to get there, then we can start managing things like mortality. We talked about how important that is for panfish and how you can't get 16-inch panfish. Well, if we want to get 56-inch muskies, we need to know how fast they get there and what their mortality rate is. We're headed towards that with this information. So that concludes what I have for um, an update on the Chippewa Flowage. I'm sure we'll open up the floor to questions. Give me one more tap, bar. I'll show you what some of you might catch tomorrow if you screw up. <coughs> Who knew there were carp in the Chippewa Flowage? Yeah, they're out there. There's not many of them, but they get huge. So we do see them once in a while. So that concludes what I've got. Uh, we'll open up the floor, and I'm sure the bar is still open, too. Thank you.